All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who may not have been in the Dash panel earlier this morning, my name is uh, Tim Siglin. I'm the chairman of Brain Trust Digital and also a contributing editor for both um, Streaming Media Europe as well as the US Magazine. And today we're going to be talking about multi-format servers. Uh, just to kind of get a sense from people in the room, how many people use um, Flash Media Server? OK, a couple. How many use um, Wowza Media Server? Nice. How many use Real? OK, good. We're going to talk about <laughs> Real. And um, what are some other servers, perhaps, that people use? Okay, IIS. All right, that, I guess I should ask, does anybody out here use IIS server um, with the, uh, okay. <laughs> All right, a couple, good. We're actually, <clears throat> we're not gonna spend time on that because that's changing so dramatically at this point with, with Dash. Um, how many people were in the Dash session this morning? Okay, was that helpful? All right, so let's get started. We've got, um, I've got three, like I said, Adobe um, Real, which is uh, a company that's been around for a very long time, disappeared, and is coming back again. And um, then Wowza, which is, you know, the most, seems to be the most popular <laughs> server these days, definitely in terms of volume. So what I'm going to do is, um, those of you who've used these servers, you're familiar with it, I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of a sneak peek into new versions. Not so much Adobe, because Adobe actually has released uh, their version <laughs> 5. But for those of you who use Wowza, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that Wowza will let me talk about, about the new version 3.5. Um, and then also Helix version 15. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so Adobe Media Server 5, also known as Flash Media Server. It's funny, yesterday. Uh, Steve Allison, the technical evangelist um, for Adobe here, made a big deal about talking about Adobe Media Server and then referred twice in the presentation to FMS. So those of us who are used to saying FMS have to remind ourselves to say AMS. The, the um, deprecation of the Flash name was to help, the, help Adobe do a couple things. One, focus on any kind of media delivery because they're effectively saying Flash player is not as important these days as it was. When I asked the question of Steve yesterday in the <coughs> Video Infrastructure Summit, he said, of course, they still have the penetration of, I believe they quote, 97%. But the idea for moving to the Adobe Media Server is to understand that there are, place, there are players out there or plugins that are not Flash that they want to deliver to. Um, and then finally, on deprecating the name, they want to kind of get themselves ready for Dash compliance. And it would be confusing to people to talk about Flash Media Server when we're talking about Dash, which will be hopefully an industry-wide standard. Um, they also brought on a new product manager. Um, and I'll make these slides available. If you absolutely want to talk to Anuj, you can do that. I put his extension on there. Um, a couple of the things that they've said that they're that they've done and are beginning to do. One thing is moving DRM down the stack to the encoders. So traditionally the encoder has encoded, pushed it through to the server. The um, DRM has either been applied at the server, which is a relatively new thing, or it's been applied after the server. Um, what Adobe is actually looking to do now is move that DRM back to the point where the encoder Sits so that they can actually transmit it as encrypted or rights managed. And that, that's something that nobody else is doing at this point. Um, origin caches on poll, the, the example from the BBC with the, the 2012 Olympics, um, according to Adobe, they, they feel that that's better than the push model that we've done with origin caches before. So they've put that as a feature into version five and specifically version 5.0.1, which just came out. Um, the idea, as we've talked about with Dash, that fragmentation um, obviously has to be 
consistent for Dash, but that fragmentation allows you to do things like proper ad insertion. And so what they're doing with Adobe Media Server is now saying that if you use the fragmentation in Adobe Media Server, we can help with better ad targeting, we can help with inserting <laughs> fragments from, um, you know, from ads, and that's one of the, the pitches that Adobe's making. Closed captioning is another big area um, in the states, 608, line 21, and then of course 708. Um, one thing that Adobe's doing here that you'll see that wows us is sort of limited on is the ability to um, effectively embed subtitling or closed captioning into the H.264 um, video files or files using the codec. There is, uh, there's availability within the codec specification to actually carry that content, have it hard-coded in, um, and that's one of, the, one of the options that Adobe is providing. Um, and of course they're saying they can do it in not just RTMP, but also in HTTP dynamic streaming, which is um, their equivalent of say a smooth streaming or HLS, and then also HLS. But interestingly, because of the fact that they are using the MP4 file format, because the MP4, MP4 file format um, and system is actually based on QuickTime, They've also got the ability to take the time text track, which was part of the early MPEG-4 specification, and um, they have a tool to convert that time text track into captions as well. So it sort of takes us back to the days of um, smile files and time text. So if you have legacy content that you want to convert over to H.264, you'll be able to, uh, to do that. And then finally, um, for those people who use an RTMP and HDS, you can actually use the AMF messaging module to um, encode, encode closed captioning content into as well. Um, multiple language tracks, this is something that we talked about in the Dash session today. Of course, it's um, in the specification for Dash, but what you'll find for at least another year probably um, is that we will have these specialized servers that will have this functionality for um, uh, for streams before we actually get to sort of all on dash streaming servers, or sorry, dash encoding, but fragmenting servers. Um, but this is something that Adobe's done for HTTP video streams. Right now, of course, only work, works for HDS. Um, they're working on it for HLS, and of course they'll work on it for dash when they become dash compliant. In the way they do this, um, and uh, Paul from Ericsson this morning talked about this was the idea of late binding. So effectively you have your MP4 video elementary stream, you have multiple audio elementary streams, you don't actually bind them together until late in the process so you can fragment up the video, fragment the audio, align those together and you can have multiple languages and then choose which language you're gonna send through uh, with the video file. The, the big benefit is you don't have to duplicate and repackage everything for each different language. So you effectively are sending, you can send up to, I believe, seven stereo channels of different languages and choose which language to deliver out. Now that's not exposed at the player, um, although that's one of the hopes with Dash is that Dash players would have the ability to do, like we've done with satellite audio, basically choose alternate audio tracks. But it, it does at least keep the assets down in terms of the number of assets that are required for, um, you know, for delivering to multiple countries or multiple languages within a country. Um, and Adobe's point is that before the packaging or after the packaging, the assumption would be you would tend to pick after the packaging if you want more flexibility. Content protection for iOS devices. Um, the goals mentioned up here to be able to do it for all three protocols that they support. iOS device um, content protection has been very difficult to do. One of the early ideas was to use the UDID um, that's the unique identifier on an iPhone or an iPod Touch or an iPad 
The problem, at least in the U.S., is that Apple ran afoul of some privacy laws, and so they went back to developers and said, no, you can't use the UDID to track people. Um, so there, there was a bit of a stoppage on that, but uh, Adobe has pushed forward and figured out a way to do it. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about some of the other servers that do the same thing, but each of them kind of goes at it from a different standpoint. Um, HLS, uh, to mention what we talked about this morning again in Dash, HLS, because it's MPEG-2 transport stream, doesn't have a way to inherently within the packets um, do a device binding or uh, doesn't have a way to do device binding anyway. So typically anything sent to an iOS device can be replicated out because you're not able to lock it to the particular device. Fragmented MP4 does have an inherent way to do the encryption, but again, they had to figure out a way beyond the UDID um, or beyond that unique serial number. So they have two ways that they go about this. The first one is to use Adobe Access uh, DRM license server, which is a completely standalone digital rights management server that sits out to the side um, and effectively when it's segmented and encrypted and delivered, then um, it, the policies can be implemented. Adobe provides an Objective-C library for iOS. iOS is an Objective, um, uses Objective-C for applications and effectively what you do is you put the, you put part of that library into an application and you make a call uh, from that standpoint. Um, and of course, the benefit for broadcasters is having a separate license like that, they can do a significant um, level of encryption and rights management um, to allow them to secure the stream. The second way, and this is built into the new Adobe Media Server, something called protected HLS, and effectively what they've done is they've taken a module, uh, a, a modular version of the Adobe Access Server, it's fairly lightweight, put it right into the Adobe Media Server. It's limited in terms of the types of, uh, of options you have in terms of how you can set content to, um, to be destroyed at a future date, um, but it is, a, uh, it is an option. It's sent as part of the metadata, so it's somewhat exposed, um, but the rights themselves are negotiated between the media server and the player as opposed to having to have a separate licensing server. So it's a lightweight version easier to do, not quite as secure. Um, and then finally on Adobe, the um, pricing has, uh, Adobe says they've simplified the pricing. To me, I don't really see that the pricing has been simplified because if you look at this, you've got, I, I put four of like six different versions, but the standard, they you know, of course are competing with Wowza on that price point, professional 4,500, extended, um, those of us who write in the industry, we were told the pricing before it came out, and then we were told that we weren't allowed to say what the pricing was, um, which to me was sort of defeated the purpose, but you can roughly say a multiple of 10 to get to the extended version. And then Amazon Web Services, um, the subscription model, let me actually just show you an example here real quick on what that looks like. Before I do that real quick, you notice here where it says core products, you have the media server, you have Amazon Web Services, um, and then you have Adobe Access down here, which is a separate standalone, as well as the open source media framework, framework or OSMF, which is where the money is the, uh, on where Adobe will do Dash from a player standpoint, the open framework. If you want to do an, uh, a uh, Amazon Web Services instance, rather than buying the license, here are the models. Um, I'll show you North America because I'm most familiar with that, but effectively, it's a one-time charge for the licensing fee, um, a recurring monthly charge of $5. Oh, that's not good. Hang on a second. Talking to my own screen. Um, all right, so there's a one-time charge for setting up using um, 
Amazon Web Services. Uh, then there's a $5 recurring monthly fee. Again, these are the US prices. Um, and then what you're looking at to determine what you need and in the states, they because Amazon has different um, different nodes effectively, what you have to do is choose one of the different ones and you choose where you want the content to be processed or, or streamed from. Um, in the States, it doesn't necessarily make that big of a difference, although Virginia and Northern California are May East and May West respectively, which means you can reach across the Atlantic from Virginia fairly easily at the interconnect point. Same thing in California, you can reach across the Pacific. Oregon is um, closer to Amazon's headquarters. And then you can see effectively what, what number of simultaneous connections you would, uh, you would have. And it's per hour or partial hour. So while they've simplified perpetual licensing, the, the instances like this, they haven't necessarily um, simplified very much. Um, before I move to Real and Wowza, does anybody have questions on Adobe Media Server? <coughs> Those of you who have are using Adobe Media Server, um, is there an intent to move to a server like Wowza? Just curious because uh, it, it seems like Wowza certainly is getting significant inroads. Um, all right, so going back then, so that, that's Adobe Media Server. Real networks, um, those of you who remember Real from days gone past, I'm actually gonna bring this up and show. So Real was the initial company that came out with a streaming server. Um, and for people like myself who got involved in the industry in 97, 98, we had uh, real audio, real G2, um, real video. Then um, real sort of fell away. That it was used in education and in some enterprise. And uh, they began working on something called the Helix Universal Server where they supported Windows Media, MP4, they then pushed forward, um, you can see 2004 to 2010, not a whole lot of change, 3GPP, um, started using Flash in 2010, and uh, they actually now use Flash encoders on the front side, but um, they're also starting to come back into, um, into the mind share a bit because of MPEG Dash. Now, I asked who was using real networks, he Helix server, nobody raised their hand. Um, one of the issues that real has is kind of being able to differentiate from somebody like Wowza. Um, but we'll go ahead and run through a couple of the things that they've done, including a few things that they're gonna do as part of, um, part of 15. Right now, they're currently at four, version 14, um, and they're moving to version 15. Um, the, uh, one of the things that intrigues me about Helix is they're basically saying HTTP is the way we're gonna go for delivery. So you don't have legacy RTMP, you don't have um, really even RTSP, although you can do those things. Their focus, they wanna focus on HTTP um, because they see that as the kind of the way forward for over the top and uh, basic internet uh, delivery. Um, Dash support, they also want to set the server up so that it supports both of the sets of profiles that we talked about in the Dash session this morning, MPEG-2 transport stream and the ISO base media file format or fragmented MP4. Um, and one of the things that they have done is they've also, as they're moving forward with version 15, they're now putting out an SDK that can be put on Android devices that's effectively, uh, can calls can be made to so that you can do dash uh, play out of the ISO base media file format, um, which they've tested with version 15. I actually showed this a few weeks ago at IBC in Amsterdam and it was fairly compelling. 
um, the SDK for Android can be used in the apps, and it actually, and this is kind of a nice thing, it will go all the way back to version 2.2. When you look at HLS on Android, it only goes back to version 3. So there are a number of devices out there still running 2.2 uh, and slightly above. Um, that's one of the things that the, the Helix client SDK will be able to do. Um, and then it also has the capability of doing iOS with DRM um, or Flash or RTSP to the Android device. And I think that's, that's an important thing because of this, the simple fact that Flash has been, Flash Player for Mobile has been deprecated on the Android devices. This is a way to do Flash. Now, those of you, um, does anybody here serve content to Android devices using Flash? Okay, do you do it via RTMP? Okay, so one of the things, just uh, not really part of this, but something that I found confusion on is the idea that Flash Player, or sorry, that Flash on the Android device is dead, um, or that Flash is not capable of being played onto an iOS device. That's actually not true. It's not at the system level. You can't access it through a plugin, but every app that's pushed out of Flash Builder uh, actually has the ability to embed Air, which is the Adobe Integrated Runtime. Every version of Adobe Integrated Runtime actually has Flash Player as part of it. So effectively, every app pushed out of, um, pushed out of Flash Builder has the ability to play Flash content, but it's only at the app level, not at the system level. And that's important to remember, not necessarily for the fact that you want to to be looking forward to delivering RTMP is a long-term strategy, but it is, it is quite possible. And in fact, when you look at um, Netflix application on iOS, it used um, fragmented MP4 through Flash um, via the Air app, and they did that so that they could use PlayReady as the, um, as the DRM. Another, another feature, and this is a pretty nice feature that I've not seen on any of the other multi-format servers right now, but is the idea of IP stream ingest, um, where you can, um, you can take an IP stream either from MPEG-2 transport stream or uh, H.264 content that's coming in as pure IP. Um, so effectively, say for a... Uh, a broadcaster who's got an MPEG-2 transport stream coming down on a satellite downlink, you can ingest directly into a Helix server and then convert it to Dash or convert it to, um, to R RTMP. Um, and you notice at the bottom of this, they've tested with a number of the different encoders out there that will push out a uh, pure IP stream and have found, found it to be successful with version 15. DRM support, um, again, when we talked about the Adobe where they have the two different ways of doing it, um, this, the, the Helix version 15 has a couple different ways. Um, the, the primary things here are they're using Veramatrix VCAS, which is a plugin for HLS devices, um, inclu including Android devices. On the PC and set-top box, they're using the ViewWrite client, which is also a Veramatrix. And then um, the alternative you can do is the Helix SDK on Android. You can't use the SDK on iOS. Um, they do it for both live and on-demand. And on PlayReady, I, I can't say that they are going to do it specifically at a given time, but that is on the roadmap for them. Uh, and, and like you heard this morning with Dash, uh, I mentioned that uh, CodeShop, which is another multi-format um, media server, it comes out of Amsterdam, they've really kind of focused on multiple DRM schemes as part of, uh, part of their solution. I think you'll see each of the services, each of the servers on this list, if they don't have multiple um, DRM schemes out of the common encryption Scheme, which would which would be Play Ready, Adobe Access, Veramatrix, um, Marlin. I always forget the fifth. Um, 
but there, there are five common encryption, encryption schemes. I think you'll see each server doing at least two of those by the end of 2012, the beginning of 2013. That way, there are choices in what you do. And that also pushes all the servers to that light <coughs> binding model because you don't want to tie it down to a particular DRM. You want to be able to opt for that further down the line as well like you do with your audio. Um, CDN support for HLS, RTMP Live. Uh, tested it with Akamai. There, it seems like, at least the things that I've seen, that they're going to be able to uh, move forward with another a number of other CDN providers. HLS time shifting, that's a, uh, that's a feature that is available in other media servers, but if it's <coughs> implemented well, it may give real a, a bit of an edge. This SLTA, simulated live transmitter agent, um, effectively, it makes it look like you're sending out a live broadcast, but they're doing it in a simulated from, from file based. They've done it for a while, but they're basically trying to improve the quality of service and quality of experience. Uh, just a few other quick things. Larg I La the live archive APIs, Red Hat Enterprise Linux version 6, Oracle Linux version 6, and a number of other things they told me after they told me that I'm not allowed to talk about here. But I will say, very soon there will be a public announcement that will list out a number of those other things and there will also be a, a public release candidate that comes out. Linux is gonna lag for a bit, but the, uh, the Windows version will be out very soon. Um, any questions on real? Okay. Um, for the people here in the room that are using Wowza server, how many are using Wowza 1 or 2? <coughs> so how many people upgraded their Wowza server from 1 to 2 to 3? And how many people bought 3 brand new and had never touched 1 or 2 before? Okay. All right, got it. So um, 3's been out for a period of time. One of the big things there was they rewrote the core, not so much the serving piece, but they rewrote the architecture to allow for um, the concept of add-ons. And I'll show an example of some add-ons in just a minute. Pricing stayed the same when they did that, um, of course, the, the free upgrades. And uh, they also added in the ability to do Adobe, uh, or sorry, Amazon Web Services instances. Um, to kind of give an example on the, actually, I'll come to, back to add-ons in a few minutes. Um, closed captioning, like Adobe, the um, closed captioning and subtitling is something very important. In fact, all the server uh, product manufacturers have said that, that subtitling and closed captioning is a very important thing that they need to uh, provide, and so version 3.5 will have that in it. Um, expanded DRM, again, right now they do um, play ready with a company called ByDRM, but they're going to um, add Authentech. Authentech is one of the solutions for doing DRM for uh, HLS, and interestingly, Authentech was bought recently by Apple. So one of the questions in the industry right now is, Apple has this tendency to buy stuff and then tell um, existing customers that they're not gonna service it anymore, especially if it's something from the Windows world. So there is a question there as to whether Authentic was just purchased to be able to do HLS um, or whether uh, it will be you know, expanded. Um, sorry, if it's just purchased for the ability to do Apple um, approved HLS or whether it will be expanded to other providers to use. So that kind of have to stay tuned on that. But regardless, two options, play ready, Veramatrix. Um, version 3.5 has a better, uh, what, what Dave and Charlie at Wowza will tell you is a better SilverLight based reference player to be able to do MPEG-2 transport stream multicast. 
Um, they really felt that, felt strongly that they wanted the ability to do multicast, which is which is helpful for broadcasters, um, especially uh, cable companies and the like. Um, Dash support, but what they'll tell you, like we talked about this morning, is they're waiting for interoper inter interoperable player. Um, the capability is there, but until they're comfortable that there's a good interoperable player, they won't include that as part of the server package. They'll just assume that you're going to do the Dash serving and then you'll find your own player to, to um, play to. On um, HTTP cache origin, um, one of the things that that they that uh, Wowza said um, last year at the, at the the viz that we did, um, which was yesterday's session, they said that they really needed to be able to do both origin and edge server, and of course they've done that in the meantime. Um, now with 3.5, they're saying that you'll have the option of publishing to your own cache or to the CDN's cache. And that's important if you're looking at scaling to be able to push it out to the CDN's cache so that you don't need to replicate those, those caches. Um, and Dave Stubenthal, the CEO, said that you know, they wanted to do it right, so they took some time. They also wanted to provide the flexibility. Um, live stream recording, it's been a free add-on, but now they're actually gonna put it as part of the core server, and they're also gonna provide user administration, and I put an asterisk there because I think one of the things, if you think through, and I can't necessarily go, well, I can't go into detail, but if you think through the concept of user administration, right now everything is command line. That's a bit of a pain for people who use Wowza servers. Um, if they're gonna put user administration, it kind of tells you they're gonna start looking forward toward uh, user interface, so that's something to kind of stay tuned on. Um, media security also has been a free add-on, but it's going to be added into the core pro product for push publishing. Um, changes to the add-ons, let me jump over real quick to that. Currently, there are three premium add-ons and 22 free add-ons. And I think we all know about the three premium. It's Transcode, Network, DVR, and I can't remember the third one off the top of my head. But all of these are a series of, of um, free add-ons that you can pull down. And the concept, as Wowza describes it, is um, they want you to be able to not necessarily have bloat in your server. You can choose to put these things in if you want to. One of the things they told me is with the uh, version 3.5, as I mentioned, some of the um, some of the add-ons will actually be put back into the core server, um, but there may be other add-ons of, of things that are taken out of the server or moved back to add-ons. So those are kind of subject to change. Um, they do have one specific thing they're gonna take out of the server that they won't allow me to talk about, but when you see the, the beta, you'll be able to figure out what that one is pretty quickly. Um, protection, obviously, integration, live stream record, as I said, is gonna move into, uh, into the core server. Um, so anyway, it's a, this with version three and now uh, version 3.5, they really have um, moved to the point where they want to continue to put add-ons that are value added but not um, not bloat the server in size. Um, previewing enhanced transcoding on Linux. Let me actually jump back here real quick because I do want to talk about a couple things on the add-ons. So um, transcoder <coughs> is going to have the ability to do overlays and the o um, there's already a feature in there to do limited overlay, but now they're gonna do some with animation so that you can actually do crawls and the like. Um, and their, their thought there is 
it's not a replacement for doing interstitials or pre-rolls or post-rolls in terms of advertising, but if you can do multiple overlays on the screen, then the likelihood is you can do some branding, you can do some additional advertising with that. Um, there's not an internal encoder. It's gonna take still image PNGs with alpha channel, but the transcoder will handle the integration of overlaying layers that will then look like a single layer of, of video and still images. Um, and then of course the previewing enhanced transcoding on Linux, which I mentioned, um, you will see, I'm guessing probably three weeks or so, there'll be an announcement and uh, a public beta at that point. Um, all right, we're running a little ahead of time. So let's talk about questions. Questions on WoWs a server since Nobody really had questions on the other two servers or other servers that I didn't cover in this presentation. I can't elaborate much because that's one of the things they told me I could put in here, but I can't really talk about in detail. But. Um, if, if you look at the media security add-on that's already there, um, it doesn't support the push publishing model, but that's something that they, they felt they wanted to move it into core so that they could allow push publishing as, as part of the core process. So, sorry, I, that's about the extent I can talk on that. Other questions? Let me... Um, let me ask this, how many people in here in the serving they're doing are pushing um, content out as RTMP? Any more? Okay, we're a couple. Um, how many are pushing out as um, smooth streaming? And those of you that are doing smooth streaming, are you the ones that are also using IAS as the server? Okay. Um, what about HDS? the Adobe, and are you using a Wowza server or an Adobe server? Okay, okay, got it, so. Okay, and are you finding, is that a specific requirement of the market that you're serving that HDS be used? And then HLS, how many people are doing HLS? And those of you doing HLS, um, is anybody using a, the Adobe Media Server 5 at this point to do that? Sorry. Is anybody using Adobe Media Server 5 to do that? So those of you doing HLS are using Wowza? Okay. All right. Um, any other questions? If no other questions, I can. Uh, um, I did not ask them that specifically. They said pricing won't change, but I would assume because it's considered a dot release that if you already have version three, there won't be a cost for that. Um, and and I think uh, one of the things they also did mention is that they're going to simplify the pricing on add-ons. Um, so if you actually are using multiple add-ons, you'll see a cost savings as you go forward. You won't get money back, obviously. I, I can't talk about specifically which ones they're going to simplify down, so I, I can't really <laughs> answer that question publicly, but I would say if you can wait a couple weeks, I mean the beauty with add-ons, um, I did a, I did a network DVR time shifting uh, scenario for a couple houses of worship that had two campuses, um, and Wiles is actually now using that as an example in some of their presentations. We ran the first set of tests for 30 days, you know, and, and you can use that for for free. It's when you hit that 30-day point and move beyond the trial. 
that you then have to pay for it. So I'm not going to guarantee you you'd be safe if you started now, but you might be pretty close. Yes. Wowza is 995, um, and then the and and this is U.S. dollars, um, and so. Adobe had to respond and bring their standard server down to 995 because before that it was 2700 US, I think, so they really pushed it down. Um, and then the add ons right now vary from 495 US to 1495, depending on what you're doing. I think Transcoder is 1495. Um, MDVR is uh, is 495. Um, <coughs> any other questions? All right. Well, we have a uh, reception um, that starts on the exhibit hall at five o'clock. Apparently, there's free alcohol, and it's also the Reader's Choice Awards. So um, feel free to head head that direction, and then. Uh, after that, of course, that's the last thing of the evening, and then sessions pick back up tomorrow morning. Thank you.